Uh, yeah, a few few years back, I saw Congressman Waxman at a biosimilars conference, and I said, you really should be nicer to us. Remember, the innovative drug of today is the generic of tomorrow. Of course. Absolutely. <laughs> and he laughed, and he said, you know, you're right. <laughs> it is correct. I, I want to, I they can't talk about this, but I can now that I'm out. <laughs> uh, we got another problem in this country. It's called exclusion. Uh, it's called, uh, you often see in the newspapers about Oh, Pfizer, J and J, one of our great companies, pleading guilty to fraud and abuse in Medicare. What happens there is that something goes wrong. Maybe a salesman talks about a off-label use. How awful is that? I'm a, alive because of an off-label use. I would hope people talk about it. But maybe a salesman, you know, talks about it, and he might have been fired for talking about it. But he goes to the government, becomes a whistleblower, and says, "I know five other salesmen that are preaching off-label use." for the company and all of a sudden the DOJ gets involved, there's a lawsuit filed. Before Clinton left office, the law was that if the DOJ brings an action against one of our companies and you're found guilty of any one of those elements, you're excluded from doing business with the government anymore. Clinton left office with, a, with an executive order that extended that exclusion to anybody who does business with the government. So you can't do business with anybody who does business with the government anymore if you're found guilty. You know what that means? That means that everybody who gets into one of these investigations by the government, whether you did anything wrong or not, uh, whether you think you could prove yourself innocent, you can't take that chance. Your lawyers will, lawyers will tell you, cut a deal, give them so many hundreds of millions of dollars, in some cases, you know, billions. billions of dollars, plead guilty to a criminal charge, otherwise you're out of business in America. Now, I, I, just, I just had to go through that with the company. Had done nothing wrong. Every single document was right. Every patient was correctly assigned to the right cause. Everyone had a doctor assigning that patient to that cause. I questioned the medical necessity of some treatments. Subjectively. And that company had to belly up tens of millions of dollars. A little small business in America. It, 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 they can't talk about it. They're all scared to talk about it because the, the DOJ is going to pay attention to them again. The truth is we've got to change that someday in America. That is an inhibition to, let me put it bluntly, to what ought to be an active and, and vibrant converse, conversation among doctors and patients and everybody about how drugs are used and how they're used differently outside of labels to make a difference in patient lives. I, I showed them a drug I'm taking today. The gallbladder drug. I had a perfectly good gallbladder. It's got a side effect that keeps me alive. Now, I learned that off label from a doctor who figured it out. And now a lot of people are using that drug for that purpose. It's off label. The company can't talk about it. The company cannot tell anybody that that drug has a beneficial effect on people like me to keep me alive. Otherwise, I go to jail. Otherwise, I get out of business. Something. Hey, we got to change those laws. Actually, the court just ruled that in the last <laughs> month that they can actually do that. In that one district. In that one district. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> By the way, the court ruled since we paid this big amount of money to the government that, that, that uh, what we did was perfectly okay. The medical necessity was not a question. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, we paid them. I, I wondered whether we should get a bouquet of roses <laughs> and a refund, but I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah, and right. rebate. I, so, I, so let me ask. Well, no, I, I just wanted to jump back real quickly on, on the, uh, the, the issue of uh, personalized medicine and, uh, and, and, time, and comments about the bringing drugs to market and, and mis, misperceptions in terms of no, un, lack of understanding about the cost there. And because I think, you know, as we have discussions, J&J &J is, uh, is very actively um, linking up, um, you know, diagnostic biomarkers with our drug development programs uh, because yeah. we feel that's the, you know, the, the way the way to go um, to most appropriately target our, our drugs uh, to patients, you know, where they'll be effective. But um, you know, it, it, at the same time, you know, while while we do, you know, there there are potential savings uh, to be realized there from better targeting the drugs, fewer complications. <clears throat> you know, I, I think people don't. Uh, often connect that uh, that there's not necessarily substantial savings on the development side that uh, you know you still have to go through the testing and, and um, you know and sample sizes and everything so um, you know it, and, and then at the end you know you've got a, a more targeted uh, population mm -hmm. to to treat patients with so you know that is, is uh, I think lumped in with this idea of not uh, not really 
you know, conceptualizing how long it takes or the, you know, the, the costs uh, of, of making these great advances in uh, making medicines more effective. And, and actually, once again, the way that the FDA is structured is, is hampering some of those efforts because you have the Center for Devices, the Center for Drugs, where some of the biologics are also regulated, and not only do you have different centers, but the regulations are different between devices and drugs and biologics. And of course, between drugs and biologics, not only the regulation is different, but the law is different. You know, one's food, drug, cosmetic, and the other is the uh, Public Health Service Act. And so you have all these differences. And so if you try to have a diagnostic that's paired with a drug, let's say, mm -hmm. you could have it as part of that ND, drug NDA. Mm -hmm. And so then therefore you've got the, the drug people looking at the device part and maybe with a consult to devices, or if it's a standalone device that's under a PMA or a 510K, then you have the device people, but then you have to coordinate that with the, the drug part. And, and the nightmare scenario was, when I first started at FDA, they had the Helicobacter pylori breath test. This was back in the mid-90s. And it was a combination of a drug, which was a C13 urea, as well as a 510K device, which is a little breath device. So the device part went through, no problem took so long, took years for the C13 urea, because there were some CMC problems and stuff. And then finally, you know, it came together and got approved, and then they had to eight, wait 18 months to get the code for, for reimbursement. But it's just, it's amazing how such a simple device, because it was in two centers under different, you know, regulations, just added to the complexity. And being able to fix that, well, you know, to, to this day, we still haven't Well, you, you made my solution. case for revolutionary change at FDA. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's not just how they do the business, it's how they're structured and the crazy, as you said, even contradictory rulemaking sometimes that occurs among those complementary devices. That's a, that's a real that's a real problem. We've seen mm -hmm. it all over the, by the way, you know Dean Kamen, the guy that invented the Segway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. He also invented a, a wonderful prosthetic arm for our soldiers who are losing their arms. And it, it can actually pick up grapes. It's a real hand. Mm -hmm. and, and he's got it where he's got the right torque and the strength, everything the, the, the soldiers, uh, the men and women coming back who need it uh, want. You can adjust it all kind of, it's a beautiful device. A FDA treated it as a dangerous medical device. Uh, he went to a conference and brought a, a he brought a, a, a chainsaw mm -hmm. uh, to the conference. He said, now this is a dangerous device that you can attach to your arm, not my hand that can pick up grapes. <laughs> this you ought to regulate, but you can buy it at Walmart. <laughs> this one you got to go through regulatory processes at, at FDA that, that confound uh, uh, any intellectual. Uh, we got to change that. <laughs> but, but you can understand why FDA is so reluctant about risk, because yep. here the FDA approved the Da Vinci robot as a 510K, and of course it's been yep. amazing in surgery, but there have been some bad outcomes, and now they're being sued, and if you're watching TV uh, and see some of these law commercials, it's, you know, you go to www.badrobot.com you know, to, you know, to find out how you can sue over a, a robot injury. So, you know, yeah. part of it of what FDA's risk aversion is being driven by is by, by the lawsuits. By the lawsuits, that's right. I, I used mm -hmm. to say at Pharma that uh, we, we live in a very risk-based society and crossing the street is risk. Mm -hmm. Investing in the stock market is mm -hmm. risk. How else do you explain marriage unless you understand risk? <laughs> uh, you know, there are risks all around us. And, and the FDA, unfortunately, uh, is so risk-adverse today that it doesn't take the ordinary risks that you and I take every day in yeah. our lives. Right. Uh, that, that's, again, that's a symptom of, of a bigger problem, and the bigger problem is that we have bureaucratized, bureaucratized a process that really ought to be scientific, ought to be straightforward, mm -hmm. and it ought to be rational. And it is none of those things today. So let me, uh, I, I wanted to ask uh, TF one more topic before we open before up to the audience, um, which is, you know, we are in the middle of a, a budget crisis deficit you know, all of that, you know, that, that's going to have some influence on, yep. on, the, on the laws and, and what, what not. But also, um, you know, we're talking about changes at the FDA. You know, <laughs> some of the changes will require funding. And, 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 and talking of good science, you know, good, uh, you know, research at the, at the uh, you know, National uh, Institutes of Health and, and, and so forth requires funding. So should we just say, you know, for the next 10 years, nothing's going to happen because of the 
because of the financial uh, crisis, or, or do you think there's something that, that still can be done? Can, can I do a mea culpa first? Yeah. I mean, I, I got asked by a fellow Republican yesterday whether I thought our country's problem was a lack of funds or a lack of or too much spending. Yeah. And I surprised him um, by mea culpa. I mean, we, we passed Part D without paying for it. Mm -hmm. That created debt. It's a lot cheaper than we thought, about a half mm -hmm. trillion dollars cheaper than we thought it would be. So it's a good, good investment, but nevertheless, a debt. We fought two wars without paying for it. Uh, that, that's, that's on our tablet. Um, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm not ever going to be president. If I were president, you know what I'd ask you to do today as Americans? I'd ask us all to do. I'd ask us to go pay for those two wars. I'd exempt every family that sent a son or daughter to it and ask everybody else in America to chip in 10, 20 bucks a month, whatever we had to do to pay for it, put us back on an equal footing, and then talk about our spending. But here we are, huge spending problem, with 77% debt, uh, debt to GDP uh, ratio in 2016, according to uh, the White House this week. Uh, Greece started going under at 100%. We're, gonna, we're closing in on that number. Uh, we're all going to have to learn how to speak Greek or, or something, or Spanish or something, for sure. Um, so the answer is, you will not see a doubling of the NIH budget that you saw when I first came to Congress. That's over. Uh, you're not going to see more funding for the FDA. Uh, the FDA is relying upon Padufa. It's relying upon these companies to put up the money uh, to fund it, its development. And that is not going to change. Congress is going to, if anything, ask more money from them to, to, to give uh, FDA the resources it needs. Um, what you're going to see is an amazing, horrible political year where the president uh, is going to hang military cuts over Republicans' heads and, and, and entitlement cuts over Democrats' heads, and, uh, and, and they're going to be in that awful position they were the last time they raised the debt ceiling. And, uh, and it's going to be up to us in the private sector, I think, to do more and more of the heavy lifting when it comes to uh, uh, developing new products and new, new therapies and, and maybe coming together around reform uh, around the processes. Um, by the way, I'm writing an op-ed right now on, on the debt. It's the last time we ought to have a fight over raising our debt. I, I've got a solution. And the deal is that whenever you raise the, the debt, you, you know, the, the spending, whatever party does it, ought to have to simultaneously raise the debt ceiling mm -hmm. instead of leaving it to the next guys to do it. Mm -hmm. Maybe take the politics out of it and come back to some sanity. To answer your question is we're, we're going to see an awful partisan year this year uh, and if you think it's bad this year, what will you get in the next year when you got the off-year elections when the president is going to try to win the House? Uh, it's not going to be pretty. My, my guess is that we're not going to deal with these things until we get closer to crisis. It's usually what we do in America. <laughs> and, but we're getting there. You know, I look at health care a little different, though. I think health care actually has some great opportunities. We spent $2.7 trillion dollars on health care in the United States. And, you know, people have estimated how much of that is wasted or not. I think, though, there are great opportunities to save money in health care so that you can actually make room in the bucket for the new drugs. I actually think generics work that way. I think when you use a generic drug appropriately, what happens is it costs less and that leaves more money to spend on the new drugs that come out. Yeah. And so I think that. There is a balancing act that you can do, and there's a lot of overtreatment in the United States. There's a lot of overdiagnostics. One of the great things we get to see managing for 100 million people is the variability of care. And there is a lot of variability out there, and not all of it's good. And so there's examples that are really good. You got a drug which I will tell you we would not have reimbursed. You would not have reimbursed it. And so I'm right. here to tell you that we would not have done it. On the flip side. There are so many cancer patients that are getting drugs today that we know aren't going to be effective, yet they're allowed to continue to get those regimens because they're not seeking out the best That's care. That's and so there is a lot of waste that can be taken out of health care, unlike most of, many other segments. And it is up to the private sector, not the government, it is up to the private sector to actually try to find those opportunities. The reason Medicare Part D has come in so far under budget it's because one of the brilliant things about it is it's a public-private partnership. It is administered by companies like ours, and we're the ones that help drive down those costs. And you don't see elderly going to Canada anymore to get their prescriptions because they can get yeah. affordable drugs in the United States. Their satisfaction with the program is sky high because it really works. But it's not because the government runs it. It's because the private sector Because we created a competitive environment yeah. for it to happen. That's correct. By the way, how much do you think we spend in America on, on drugs? 
We've spent about $330 billion. That's correct. And how much do we spend on drug, uh, cigarettes and alcohol? <laughs> <laughs> Worse than that, how much do you think we spend on sports? It's the highest expenditure. We spend somewhere around $700 million, billion on sports mm -hmm. every year. And the final question I ask you is, what do you think was the highest paid profession in the Roman Empire the year it collapsed? The gladiator. The gladiator. <laughs> uh, I asked the question, is 20%, 18%, of, of our GDP expenditures on healthcare, the right numbers are too much? Or should we be the, remembered one day as a nation on, on the planet that was able to spend 25% of its resources, or 30% on the health of its people? Uh, you know, not too long ago, uh, half of the country was working in agricultural occupations, providing food for the rest of us. It was 80% at one time. We're down to what, 2.5% of the people work in agriculture to feed the rest of us and the rest of the world. Uh, you know, food is relatively cheap, housing, all, the need, all our needs are relatively cheap. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we, if we could be remembered as a society that succeeded so well in providing for all the needs of its people that we could put a quarter of our resources or more into maintaining their health, extending their lives, and making the, the last 10 years of a couple's life one in which they know each other instead of living with strangers because of Alzheimer's. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that be a wonderful thing to say about this country? So I, I don't know what the right number is, Stephen. All I know is that we got a crisis of, 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 of fiscal crisis we can't escape. In the end, we're going to make decisions about that. We say, if you don't have your health, you got nothing, right? We say that. Do we mean it? Mm -hmm. If we mean it, if the health is more important than video games and television and and whatever else, uh, sports that we enjoy, I love sports, but if it's more important than them, then why should we be so afraid of putting more of our resources behind it? I kind of think we should. I kind of think we should. Yeah, I was just uh, to jump in on that, that uh, you know, when, when uh, you know, people talk about the, the health reform bill, that there are kind of three buckets there, the, the uh, coverage expansion, uh, the financing to help pay for that, and then the third uh, is you know, generally characterized delivery system reform. To, um, yeah. and, you know, I think you know, the, the uh, optimistic view of that is to try to uh, to, to bend that cost curve and um, you know to, to begin to you know in the long term um, deal with some of these issues of waste and inefficiencies in the system. Whether it's going to you know be as successful as the optimists think or or as uh, unsuccessful as as those who have a more negative view, I think that, uh, and, and you know, we are spending actually a lot of time because, you know, uh, working on, on kind of uh, on what this all means for for our customers and and kind of the changes that it means and who our customers are because, uh, you know, what what you're seeing is um, really payers kind of pushing the risk down to the local providers through things like accountable care organizations and, and holding, you know, building in quality linked with uh, quality measures with, and bundling, with payments, bundling Bundling's payments. Coming. So, yeah. um, which I, I think, you know, is a lot of it is, is on the right track to move away from this fee for service, you know, uh, the more you do, the more you get uh, system to really improve uh, the coordination of care and management uh, of the patients that, you know, but it, it does, you know, change there's, as with many things, opportunities and challenges in there and that's what we're spending a lot of time on. But. Cool. And can I, can and I, I and I agree with your point, you know, FDA is not going to be getting any more money, but I think a lot can be done to make it more efficient. And and I think, you know, a wonderful example, I, I was at FDA for almost 12 years, so my personal belief is they really need to restructure you know, and over time, as they've gotten more money, they become such a matrix organization, and now they have an office of translational science and an office of this, and, and then offices become super offices. So then you have to hire more support staff. And, and what you need are reviewers. You know, you don't need people to help in the review. You need people to do the review. And I think if they realize what is their core mission, and and you, know, uh, we were joking if if everybody who had the word assistant in their title was you know changed. To be a reviewer, you have more than enough individuals because you know the assistant means they're helping or they're supporting, but they're not actually doing. We we need doers, not not helpers. Oh, can I can I can I wrap before we go to people on a on a really cool note? Uh, I, I told you a little bit about how you and this industry and all of you are making a difference in family lives in minorities who never knew 
uh, who never saw grandparents. You begin to see the grandparents now. Uh, you know, there are great disparities in treatment in America and healthcare. One of them is minority. I, I've talked to minority groups who, they gave me some percentage, you know, it was kind of frightening about the number of kids who ne never knew a grandfather, grandparent, grandmother, because of the disparities. Now they're beginning to do that. If you haven't become a grandparent yet, let me, let me tell you one quick th story about little Ashton, my, my first grandchild. A birthday party. He jumps in my lap four or five times. Leaves the other kids, come jump in my lap, which is cool. At one point he says, Papa, he says, I love you more than anything in the whole world. And I said, Ashton, how much your mom and dad? And he looked around to make sure they weren't listening, and he said, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's what it should be all about. <laughs> really. Now let's, let's open it up to the uh, audience. Any, any questions? Cool? <laughs> yeah. We've been talking most of, most of the time here. We'd love to hear right. what your thoughts are. So very interesting. Thanks. I enjoyed uh, listening to the conversation. Uh, I know this is a pharma meeting, but I got a device question. Obviously, the two are related for the conversation. So everybody's favorite subject, medical device tax. Um, I can tell you in our company, this is $30 million or more that's coming out of jobs or yeah. would have been spent on R&D for sure. I understand this week, uh, houses were, or, uh, bills were introduced in both the House and Senate to repeal. Yeah. So my simple question is, what are the chances? Uh, the, the, you know, there was a, a huge uh, battle around the device tax when Obamacare was passed. And uh, in the end, they had, to, they had to show that at least technically the bill was paid for. Mm -hmm. They still have that problem. Uh, you should know that 30 bills have been passed in the House to amend Obamacare. Three of them become law. They become law. They're minor changes. But to make a change that's going to repeal a significant amount of the income going behind it requires them under PAYGO to find an offset which means they have to cut somewhere else to make room for it. They make exceptions to that now and then, like the doc fix. Mm -hmm. They very likely are going to uh, you know, make sure the doctors don't have to suffer a 27% cut from Medicare services uh, because you'll, you'll lose a lot of Medicare mm -hmm. doctors. You won't have them in many towns of America. So they make exceptions to it. The question is, will this administration make an exception for, <laughs> for this industry? to get out of one of the taxes it agreed to as part of the packages around Obamacare. Uh, I, I kind of doubt that you're gonna succeed, okay? Uh, we, we, you know, pharmaceutical industry outside of devices also pays a significant fee. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the only good thing we got out of that was we got it structured so that it was less of a fee on the smaller companies and, a larger fee on the bigger companies. Yeah. We got it progressively structured. Uh, to be blunt, I don't think I don't yeah. think you're going to get there as much as I'd love to see you get there. Yeah. I was going to say I, I think I'm a little bit more hopeful, but not much <laughs> more. I, I was actually in Washington earlier this week at the American Enterprise Institute, where House uh, Majority Leader uh, Eric Cantor spoke about this very issue, and I think he made some really good points, you know, in his remarks as well as in the Q&A. I mean, the medical device industry is a special industry. It's, you know, small companies, mom and pop, you know, many are struggling to survive, and is that really, you know, what's the impact on innovation? So I think from a job standpoint, I think if, if this is going to carry the day, it's not going to be from a device industry standpoint, but it's going to be from a jobs perspective. Yeah, or, I think that's probably or, the strongest. patient perspective. I mean, yeah. that's the only way we got that, that, that tort law reform. Right. Because we made the case that patients weren't going to get the benefit of the devices. I think it's going to have to be on, that, on jobs and, and patients. If you put it on the economy of the, of the company or the, yeah. I don't like to pay taxes, you ain't going to win that. Trust me. <laughs> They're for raising taxes around their place right now, not cutting them. Another thing I would, would, would add, uh, to agree with, with both of what's been said, uh, my understanding is uh, that there's, you know, Advomat, of course, is, is very aggressive looking at this, the device industry trade association, and, um, you know, looking to um, enter it into the mix in terms of any sort of tax reform uh, legislation that, you know, may, uh, may help to, uh, to make it more workable. Don't get excited there. <laughs> uh, let me tell you the dynamics there, guys. Uh, before the election, the president said he would like to see deductions and exemptions, you know, cleaned up, uh, simplify the tax code. 
and use that money to reduce the corporate tax and some other taxes that would help small businesses grow, et cetera. Since he's gotten elected, he said, no, he wants the revenue. Now, if you were a Republican and you wanted to simplify the tax code the way Reagan attempted to do rather successfully by getting rid of a lot of deductions and exemptions and lowering rates, why would you enter in that discussion with the president when he really, all he wants is new revenue? You just gave him new revenue with higher taxes on, on the top one or two percent of Americans. Now he wants more revenue. Why would you enter into that discussion? I don't think they're gonna get the tax reform because of that. Mm -hmm. Now if the president were to change his mind and say, I really want a, a small business uh, incentive bill and, and I want to eliminate some of the complications of the code to save money to put it on that bill and maybe repeal that tax, got a shot. He's gotta change his mind. Mm -hmm. In the end, you're not gonna pass anything over this guy's veto. So Eric Cantor may be for something on the House side, the Republicans mm -hmm. may be for it. But if I gave you the number of bills that have passed the House and have died in the Senate, it'd be rather shocking. Yeah. They haven't passed a budget over there in three years, mm. much less any House bill. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get too hopeful is what I'm telling you. Any other questions? By, by the way, uh, you, you, you might want to think about this. Uh, in the, one of the last years of my service in Congress, I went around the country with Dick Army debating the question of if we could get rid of the income tax, what should we replace it with? And he stood for the proposition of a flat tax and I stood for the proposition of a, of a retail sales tax. And we debated in 40 cities across America. I've never, never touched a hotter political button. Mm. More people hate this current income tax structure and and, and the, way it, the way it directs our lives and the way it incentivizes one behavior and punishes another from birth to death and even after death, that they're so ready for a simplified tax system. And one, hopefully, that's border adjustable mm -hmm. to help our companies export products without having to export tax uh, load as well. Um, I think 2016, you're finally gonna see that become a very big part of the presidential debate. Mm -hmm. If they don't get to tax reform this year, it's gonna come up in 2016. What I would worry about as, as this industry, as all of you should worry about some, if they do get to tax reform, the president has said very clearly one of his objectives is to tax foreign earned income. This is a global industry now. Mm. This could be very damaging to a global industry when you go that route. Mm. Uh, I, again, I, I have very pessimistic views about mm us getting into a tax reform debate now. I think one is coming in 2016, big time. Yeah. By the way, in the book I wrote, I called for tea parties to form across America in 1997. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the Mayans were wrong, but you were right. <laughs> <laughs> well, with that, uh, I would would like to thank all the panelists for uh, a fantastic discussion today. And um, so, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, guys.